Welcome to Booked, where two guys tell you about the books they're reading. I'm Livia Snudden. And I'm Rob Olson. The book that we're going to be talking about tonight is A Lush and Seething Hell by John Horner Jacobs. It's been a while um, since we've done anything. I know that you probably don't have this at hand, but we reviewed The Incorruptibles, and that had to be like five years ago, I'm guessing. Yeah, easily. Yeah. So far ago that I don't remember i know you refreshed my memory on this machines right driven by demons demonic yeah energy yep. or whatever yep. yeah yep. i remember liked it yeah but after so many book reviews you start to forget what some of them were about yeah they all kind of mix together yeah. so i have a funny uh john horner jacobs story oh. um that i didn't even think about till we just started talking so i'm gonna say it before i forget it um friend of the podcast ryan mccray ryan the marketing intern um former marketing intern former marketing intern uh i I don't remember exactly how this went down but he had read something by john horner jacobs and was on twitter uh kind of like just you know like building it up talking it up and um he he added john horner jacobs and something to the effects of like how he should go on booked I remember this. Yeah. And, and I had to be like, uh, yeah, we did that. And I linked to <laughs> our interview, which was, you know, 20, what, 14 or 15 or whatever. So, and he's like, oh, wow, that's amazing. But it was just funny that like he was, he thought he was um, scooping us this like hot new author. And it was someone that we'd already talked to and inter- or, or reviewed a book from and stuff. As I specified, former marketing intern. Former marketing intern. Yep. But that's exactly how we met, and that's why the story's funny because we work, uh, we worked at the same place. He he has since left that place, um, and we he saw my, the my booked tattoo on my arm, and he's a big reader, so he was like, "Oh man, if you like reading, you should check out Chuck Wendig." And I was like, <laughs> "Yeah, I interviewed that guy. We've reviewed like three of his books." <laughs> <laughs> so he's he's on the he's right on the ball. He's got it right. He knows what we like. He's just a little just... behind the times. Yeah, time for Ryan to turn us on to somebody we don't know about. Ryan, if you're listening, throw us throw us something. We've got we've got some gaps in the schedule coming up. So next next year he's gonna be like, you got to check out this Mark Danielewski guy. Yeah, yeah. Um, speaking of which, dude, did you get to listen to that interview? Like, listen to it, not like just participate in it. Mm, only when I edited it. No, it's good stuff, man. Yeah, I, so I, I just want to say because it's. It's really hard. I know that sounds stupid because, like, you do the interview and you're like, man, I'm, I'm pretty sure that was a really good interview. But you have to – you almost have to listen to it when you're not involved to kind of pick up on things. So I know I'm wasting my time saying this because anybody who listened to it didn't do the interview except, you know, for you and any rate. Well, I, it was a really yeah. great interview. I'm really happy we did it. When you're doing the interview, you're you're – thinking about you're thinking ahead so you can't concentrate just on the conversation sometimes because you have to steer the ship as well so yeah it's it's not easy to step back and and just and enjoy it agreed so um let's get on with a book review man tell us a little bit about john horner jacobs you can leave out the ryan mccray stuff you just <laughs> john horner jacobs has been contacted on twitter by uh, so this, I'm going to, uh, right up front, I'm going to say this amazing bio I'm about to read to you was heavily edited, uh, by, uh, me and Livius before we started recording because there was all kinds of stuff that's just like, I don't know, it really mires it down a little bit. So I feel like this is a lot smoother. It's going to tell you the information you need to know if, if like you like our conversation about this book we're about to talk to talk about. So here we go. John Horner Jacobs is the author of Southern Gods. Uh, The young adult series, the Incarcerado trilogy, comprised of The Twelve-Fingered Boy, The Shibboleth, and The Conformity, as well as the Fisk and Shoe fantasy series composed of The Incorruptibles, Foreign Devils, and Infernal Machines. His fiction has appeared in Playboy Magazine, Cemetery Dance, and Apex Magazine. That is a very good bio. It was great. So much information. So so condensed. (laughs) Here is the uh, synopsis in its full unadulterated, unedited length here. The award-winning and critically acclaimed Master of Horror returns with a pair of chilling tales that examine the violence and depravity of the human condition. Bringing together his acclaimed novella, The Sea Dreams It Is the Sky, and an all-new short novel, My Heart Struck Sorrow, John Horner Jacobs turns his fertile imagination to the evil that breeds within the human soul. 
a brilliant mix of the psychological and supernatural, blending the acute insight of Roberto Bolaño and the eerie imagination of H.P. Lovecraft. The sea dreams it is the sky examines life in a South American dictatorship. Centered on the journal of a poet in exile and his failed attempts at translating a maddening text, it is told by a young woman trying to come to grips with a country that nearly devoured itself. In My Heart Struck Sorrow, a librarian discovers a recording from the Deep South, which may be the musical stylings of the devil himself. Breathtaking and haunting, A Lustion Seething Hell is a terrifying and exhilarating journey into the darkness, an odyssey into the deepest reaches of ourselves that compels us to confront secrets best left hidden. The funny thing is, um, <laughs> in this synopsis, the sea dreams it is the sky has a bigger chunk of the synopsis, and I feel like there's kind of less to talk about. And then my heart struck sorrow <laughs> has like one sentence, and I think there's so much more to talk about. I'm going to agree, but we should still likely take them in order. Sure. Um, I uh, <laughs> where to start? We're introduced um, to Isabel, who's the protagonist, and uh, through her, we're introduced to a character named Rafael Avendano. Avendano. God damn it, this is going to be tough. Rafael Avendano, um, who's also known as The Eye, which I want to tell you <laughs> that if you want to get someone's interest in a character, like introduce them as The Eye, because I was immediately taken in. <laughs> I, seriously. Yeah. And the fact, so she refers to him as the I for a good portion of this story, which I still think is amazing. Because I'm telling you, every time you'd read it, like you would feel, I felt a little bit of a of a tug somewhere. Like when I was like, oh, the I, like like it's a bigger deal than if she just called him Raphael the whole time. I agree. But the two of them meet in a in a cafe. Um, she's a teacher, and he is uh, a uh, long believed dead author. So they're in Spain, I believe. And um, the connection they have, Isabel is is from the same country as the I. And so they strike up kind of a... They, it, it starts this happenstance. They, they happen to be at the same cafe or whatever. And um, she, re, she realizes that this guy, because he's got a freaking eye patch, um, it's, he's, he's pretty easy to kind of pick out in a crowd. Um, every time he's there and she's there, he always kind of faces her and is is obviously paying attention to her. And there's kind of passing mention in the the narrative that like if the if you're from, you know, their country of Majer- Majera, mm-hmm. um, you could tell you could you could tell a Majera a Majerin, and so um, eventually the arm's length just like him kind of paying attention to her turns into an interaction and then they confirm they're both from Majera and uh, a a very um, kind of tentative friendship is is struck up tentative in as much as like he's like a weird old dude who is paying attention to a much younger like female and so they, they start to talk and stuff and then an actual kind of friendship blossoms out of that. That's kind of how it all starts. Mm-hmm. Um, the country they're from, and man, this is going to be bad if I'm wrong, is a fictional country. I looked in South America. Okay. I could There's not been... find okay. a Majera. <laughs> so if it existed in history, it doesn't now, as far as I can tell. Yeah. Although the book does take place very recently. I don't think a time is really established, but it yeah. definitely takes place in our lifetime. Um, which is interesting. So I'm not, I'm going to break off for a second because this is a, a novella. So it's a short story. So we'll talk a little bit more about what happens. But the interesting thing is, is that it was very believable as a country. And the reason I say that is that Jacobs did a really, really good job of constructing a history, even location wise. Like, I, and, and I'll get this wrong because I read the book two weeks ago, roughly. Um, you know, like at one point, both characters travel to Majera. And they do it like via Brazil. You know what I mean? So it'd be like going to Gotham via Boston. You know what I mean? Where, where he creates like this really rich history for the country and makes it a really um, believable place. 
um, in so far as it relates to its political, um, you know, an uprising that happened of sorts and the politics and then its relation to the countries around it. As Rob mentioned, you know, the book starts off in Spain, which I'm pretty sure is a real country. Um, he does a really <laughs> I was reading this book and I did. I did the same thing. I looked it up and I was like, man, like he's woven this in here so well that I'm second guessing my my Google skills on, on pulling this up. So any rate, um, they share this uh, this country of origin. They both left. Um, no reason to go back. It's not a good place to live. The author himself has been banned, um, not just from Majera, but from from other countries for, for things he's had to say. He's a very. Uh, very opinionated individual. He's a poet, actually, if I, I believe yeah. correctly, right? Yeah. Yes. Um, who has managed to insult, you know, uh, you know, basically every country of of Latin, you know, every Latin country. Um, but he he leaves his home in her care because he is returning there. To he's received a message and he wants to look for a lost loved one. Yeah, and that's really where kind of like the main like focus of the narrative kicks off because in his absence she's taking care of his place and he's got all these like you know books and manuscripts and stuff everywhere and as she's kind of like just settling in and stuff she discovers a uh i guess basically like a journal and in this journal she's reading about um his time before his uh country was overtaken by an evil dictator where uh, a colleague of his died leaving him Uh, all of his books and within those books is um a a thing that he's translating called uh, a little night work and it's uh it's a really it's it's an interesting text uh the the book is filled with um just like basically a bunch of like nude photographs if i remember correctly but like wedged inside there is this translation work that he's doing on this thing called a little night work yeah. Um, so as she finds this, and it's all kind of sum up the rest of the story, and then we kind of talk about some of the things that happen inside of it. She decides that um, she she needs to find him, so she is also going to go to Majera um, to to find the eye. And that's kind of the framework for the story. Um, we didn't mention this at the beginning, and I'll, I'll say it now, um, and I'll preface it by saying that you know I I really enjoyed the story. Um, cosmic horror as a statement is not something that turns me on. Like I like horror and I know we've read some other cosmic horror and some I've enjoyed and some was okay or whatever. Um, but I, I think it's kind of the, the, the rich world that, that he creates in this and the very weird stuff that goes on in a little night work, like the, the, the circumstances surrounding Mm. this text that really like, you know, I, I guess all I can say now is that there's probably there's really good cosmic horror and there's probably like not so good cosmic horror. Right. <laughs> like, so I may have to keep a more open mind um, based on my reading of, of this of this story. Yeah. And that's actually going to be kind of one of the prevailing overall thoughts I have about this. Uh, this book that's comprised of basically two two novellas uh, is like it's it's very. um uh, it's it's definitely labeled cosmic horror and i feel like there is a cosmic horror element more than it is cosmic horror i don't know if you agree with me agree with me on that i how do i say this i don't know because i guess i don't have enough exposure to <laughs> cosmic horror to know if it's sure. just an element. You, do, do you follow what i'm saying i, I yeah. get i i do agree with what you're saying i just don't know what my expectation is the only other book that i can think of off the top of my head that we reviewed that was cosmic horror was that retelling of the H.P. Lovecraft story? Ballad um, of Black Tom. That's yes. Victor I was going to say something Tom. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, I, I think that's the only one that, as a podcast, we've done. I've tried to read some H.P. Lovecraft. It's it's really not my thing. Right. Um, I don't know if it's the writing style um, that doesn't do it for me, but the look, Fisherman, John Langan. Oh yeah, 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 and that was really good. I really like that. But really, I guess what it came down to is. You were like, Jacobs has a new book out. And I was like, let's totally do another Jacobs book. And then when I got it, I was like, oh, this is cosmic horror. And I kind of like said, oh, all right, well, we're doing it. But, you know, I'm kind of, kind of yeah, doing it's it. Not, just, just do it. It's not a selling point to me either. It's not the sexy part of the book to like. But um, and I think what you're getting at, and I think I agree, is that um, this 
see the, the, the sea dreams. It is the sky uh, is a great piece of historical fiction um, that happens to be cosmic horror. It's kind of how we look at it. Uh, <laughs> great piece of historical <laughs> fiction that never happened. Right. Well, that's yeah. why it's fiction. Yeah. So. No, no. I, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but so yeah, it's a, uh, yeah, I agree. Um, so yeah. And it's the little night work um, thing. I want to just kind of, I'm not going to go too deep into that because that probably will spoil stuff, but like it's this little night work thing that opens the door for the cosmic horror type of situation. And um, it, it's going to have a, kind of a, a, a key element to the story that is very similar to the other story, My Heart Struck Sorrow, that we're going to talk about, where basically, like, this text that is being translated um, appears to have some sort of power to it. And um, while that's not what is the cause of everything that happens in the story, it is a... a piece it, element of interest in the story and it's just like it's really weird and and yeah I, I like what they did with the little night work um built into a very good narrative of a story of you know isabel and abandonio and all the other people i agree i agree are you ready to move on to my heart struck sorrow yes all right, so I could tell by the yes in Rob's voice that this is the one he was more excited about. <laughs> um, so My Heart Struck Sorrow um, takes place uh, probably in the 1960s, be my guess, um, without some other um, grounding information around me. And we follow uh, Rob I'm gonna... Cromwell. Sorry. It's okay. They were driving a Studebaker, so I'm thinking that's oh. a little earlier, like 30s, 40s. So, yeah, Rob is right, a Studebaker. I mean, you know, you can still drive a Studebaker now, too, but I guess technically <laughs> you're right. It's probably like in the 1930s. Yeah. <laughs> um, we follow Robert Cromwell. His nickname is Crum. Um, he is a librarian, or works for the Library of Congress, but specifically in music and, and more likely um, specifically in folk music history. So uh, he gets a, a gig where somebody has died um, who has a extensive um, collection of, uh, of recordings of folk music. So they've been left to the Library of Congress and him and Hattie, his colleague, um, are tasked with going through, collecting it, sorting through it, um, listening to it, transcribing it, doing whatever it is that they do with, uh, with that type of uh, music. Yeah, and so... Uh, this, I will have to say to, to the best of my knowledge, this is the first, uh, story that I, I can remember reading where the main characters are employees of the library of Congress and really like the focal point of <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's, it's a library of Congress story. So th I think that's a first for me. That that's interesting. You're probably right. Now I'm wondering if like the library of Congress, there are just copies of these everywhere. Like, have you read this yet? It's about, it's about us. <laughs> <laughs> like finally we're getting the exposure that we're um so this story is kind of told in a um a now and then uh sort of fashion similar to the way that sea dreams it is a sky does uh as they're cataloging this estate in all of all of its possessions and stuff like that they find um a, a collection of recordings that were originally commissioned by the, the library of congress back in the day um now that's the 30s and 40s and stuff like that um it, it accompanied by journals and, and just notations and stuff like that so some of it is is practically present day and then the the other parts are following the journals of harlan parker who is a guy who was commissioned by the library of congress actually go around and um it, it's so interesting record regional secular music basically so he they wanted to catalog um like your hometown like little ditties and stuff and so they drove around like west virginia and stuff like that asking people to sing their songs which is awesome it is but um a little uh, if we narrow that down a little bit more harlan has a specific song that he's interested in. And uh, that one is known by a few different names. Um, the way that I found it and listened to it, I don't know if you did the same thing, oh, but um, Stagger Lee. 
uh, like a name like Stagger and then Lee, uh, like two words. And that's uh, that's the one he's focused on. And, and he has, you know, some reasons for wanting to hear this. But essentially, as he digs deeper, he's looking for more versions of the song. So this is a song that's been passed down, you know, from person to person, because this is kind of like, I guess, phonograph time. But it's it's been around for a while. So it's something that's um, mutated um, from different people. So, for example, he hears it sung by, you know, some white hillbillies and, you know, the lyrics are a certain way. But then he goes to a black community and, and the, the, the structure of the song is the same and the general story is the same. But there are little differences. And he starts to dig deeper and deeper into the roots of this song, Stagger Lee. Yeah. The thing I like about that is um, at the outset of the story, it's kind of established that Stagger Lee is going to be like the control song where they're trying to get his, like everybody they record to sing that song, but then also other stuff. Um, but you get the feeling that there's, there's like you were saying, um, more of a personal motivation. There's something that's fascinating to Harlan Parker about that song. And that's why he wants to investigate it. Um, and that song does have some sort of power or mystique or, or something going on with it as, as the story unfolds. I don't know how much farther we're going to go with the story, but like um, basically in the, in the present day, Cromwell is uh, cataloging, what's what happened with Harlan Parker back in the day. So he's kind of just following through that story and we're seeing, you know, bits and pieces in the, in the, in the present day, but mostly it's, it's what happened with Harlan Parker. Now is a good time, I guess, to talk about maybe a little bit on, on how these are similar. So they're told in a similar way that we're seeing someone's story through their, through somebody else looking through their documentation of the story. Right. And that these things, both so a little night work and um staggerly and staggerly i was gonna say stackily because that's one of yeah. the other there's like <laughs> three different ways that it's written um how they're things in, in this case something that exists in our world the 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 staggerly song which you can hear on youtube right now if you want to take a minute and go listen um how they have a power over people so they're they're inanimate objects in this case, a song and the other one, a, a weird box filled with, you know, old porn pictures and a manuscript um, <laughs> that have power over people. And I love these kinds of stories. In, in this case, I would say Stagger Lee is more indicative. It's like, a, um, you know, a night film. Um, there was another book I read that was like that where like video had power. Like there are certain movies that if you saw something would happen or there's a director who does, you know what I mean? Yeah. This one was even more fascinating to me because it's based in reality. Like there is an actual song. This isn't a made up, you know, I was thinking of lullaby by Chuck Palahniuk. Right. You know, had the same thing, but that was a, a made up thing for, for the book that didn't exist in, in, in our world today. So these kinds of stories always kind of fascinate me. Uh, you're right about not talking too much about it. Let's just say that we, we talk to a bunch of different people through the course of the story that either perform staggerly or have some knowledge of it that all give kind of like their insight. And it's always kind of like, well, yeah, here it is, but you really need to go see this guy. Yeah. Go track this guy down, you know. But as it happens for, for Harlan and in, in some cases for, for Crum in, in the present day, just their research into it starts to affect them. Uh, all right, so the... <sighs> I could think of better examples, but the example I'm going to go with for now is it's got kind of a ring effect to it where you watch the videotape and then something happens because of it. Um, not necessarily exactly like that. Cause that's much, that's a very a, a lame plot contrivance, but um, something, the thing I like about it is the people who are discovering these things, like our, our protagonists, Isabel uh, in the one story, and Cromwell and the other don't understand like the significance of the thing that they've stumbled upon. And by the time they become interested in it or whatever, they become involved with it. Like you start to see its effect by learning about the effect it had on other people. And I just love that type of layered, um, uh, like creepy thing. Yeah, for sure. I mean, and that's again, both of these stories had that that it factor, yeah. and exactly what you said. Like, 
we're learning through someone learning about something else. And then, like I said, for me, even the fact that it's a, you know, song, particularly in this one is, is just, just terrific stuff. And yeah. Cause it's like the power of art kind of. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's a, uh, it's, yeah, I, I, I don't. It's hard to talk about them because they're so short, right? If this was one three hundred and fifty page novel, we'd we'd probably delve a little deeper. Let's just say that all the characters are are really well rounded out. Um, they're uh, appropriately creepy if need be. Um, there's some great stuff that happens in a prison in one of these stories <laughs> that I thought was was just just really just really a great. Um, you know, like chapter, I guess would be a, a you know a way to put it, but a, a great section of, of the book. Um, and he's firing on all cylinders for for this. Even the just because there's a note in here, and I don't know what you want to talk about this, but there's a mispronunciation of an area. Yep. Um, that that this takes place in, in in my heart struck sorrow, and even that had this like weird. It, it's a parallel to the 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 different pronunciations for Stagger Lee. Yeah. Um, but even that was done in a way that felt very authentic. Like, like I could picture talking to someone like an old timer from, you know, the, the live by the river in Ohio that, you know, would talk about a place called Cider's End, but then also talk about it was called Idol's End. Yep. yep. Uh, you know what I mean? It's just some some very genuine, um, although I don't think that's an actual place, just very genuine feeling storytelling. Yeah, I think that the the what I appreciated about both the stories um probably heartstruck sorrow a little bit more than the sea dreams it is the sky is kind of just that it lives in a oral tradition kind of uh thing not necessarily just oral but like a written oral like uh, knowledge passed down from person to person type situation Uh, and it follows this it walks this line between being just a story and almost like a fable or a fairy tale. It's got that kind of fable texture to it, if that makes sense. I don't know if you agree with me or not, but um, where you could take it as a cautionary tale or or something like that, but it's really just a story you're reading. Um, So I I think he does a good job of, of making them stories that have the quality of a fable or a fairy tale or something like that built in but not in a way where the whole thing feels that way it's just got that feel to it yeah like a tone tone yeah thank you so much i know i agree i agree for sure especially in 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 um on my heart struck sorrow yeah yeah i could see this as like a a coen brothers movie or something Mm, i don't think i like their movies yeah i shouldn't i'm not sure though yeah all right (laughs) um i know we kind of feel like we started doing our wrap-ups we should probably do this properly yeah I guess I'll, I'll, I'll kick it off. Um, I remember liking the John Horner Jacobs uh, book, Incorruptibles, that we uh, reviewed before, and I just like the dude in general. So uh, obviously that's why we decided to read this. And uh, to be honest, novellas or short novels, it's it's hit or miss. You know, like I think that in the right hands, like the smaller st- size, um, you know, can can be cool because like in the, in the example of the sea dreams, it is the sky. It's maybe 120 pages or something like that. It's not super long, but it's long enough where you can tell a good deal of story. And he did a good job of making it feel bigger than the 120 pages, but feel kind of tight and succinct because it was shorter. Like it was that being said, I like the historical fiction kind of feel to that story. And, um, uh, the way that he kind of wove, cosmic horror into that my heart struck sorrow i thought was phenomenal um i think it's an incredible story um and it does such a good job of uh evoking the time that you know it's written in um as far as like how people acted and, and things like that plus like probably the the important the more importance of like an oral tradition and handing down a song from person to person or even just watching how um, one person's version of the song tells a different story from their perspective than it does from someone like the whites, the not whites, that type of thing. Um, there was just so much there. It's a very rich, richly told story that has uh, such a cool twist to it with the Stagger Lee song and what that, what power it holds and stuff like that. Um, I want to say that 
the when you learn more about what's going on, the origins of certain things uh, was phenomenally done. The explanation that you get for certain things, and I can't say what, is just phenomenally done. And I think that the end of the story was really well thought out, too. So um, I think I really like the Sea Dreams It Is the Sky. My Heart Struck Sour knocks it out of the park 100%. Overall, this book is four and a half stars. I don't know how much I'm going to be able to add to that because I think that Rob um, hit every single point. Um, super rich storytelling, great world building. So in um, the, the Sea Dreams It Is the Sky, um, the shorter of the two, uh, very, very rich um, real world um story building even from a fictional place um great interesting characters the politics felt like like they were real great stuff there i also agree i did like my heart struck sorrow um better for the same reasons that that, that you mentioned the fact that it's uh, kind of this this uh, this real thing this real song but that it's given a history in this book and a history that's uh that's dark to say the least i i also agree that i think it it closed better right like there were was a, there was a little bit of closure there that was uh, uh, put together really tightly by uh, by Jacobs. Um, I, I think that we have had the benefit of reading um, some really good novellas o- over the years in this podcast, and a lot of it because we're reading novellas from people we, uh, in, in a lot of cases, we already know are good writers versus just picking up random novellas. Um, but I would say that these uh, these definitely fit in with the really good ones that we've read. And, and yeah, I think four and a half stars is is, uh, is the right thing to do on this one. All right. Me and Livius just kind of talked about, because we're not going to do a spoiler. Uh, I don't think it makes sense to do a spoiler talk for this. Um, some of our, our likes that we, you know, things that we want to talk about that were spoilers. So we're back. Um, glad we read this book. And um, yeah, thanks, John Horner Jacobs. Yes. Good, good stuff. Do you want to um, do you want to air some dirty laundry about review copies? <laughs> uh, no, no. Look, all right. <laughs> all, all, this is what I'm going to say. Publishers, there has to be a better way to do this. That's all I'm going to say, and I'm going to keep <laughs> saying it all the time. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to get too far into it. All I can say is that we both wound up reading a paper copy, typically because of, uh, I'll say it here because I, I don't care about them. A voice is garbage. And the fact that you force reviewers to read copies using Edelweiss or the other one. What's the other one called, Rob? NetGalley. NetGalley. Awful. Just awful. And I don't know if your reviewers ever give you that feedback. That's, I guess, what I was, where I was trying to go with this. You deserve to hear that feedback. They're garbage. There has to be a better way. Uh, to silver lining this situation, um, this <laughs> the handing off of the one print copy that we had um, did mean that me and Livius got to see each other in person more more frequently than we usually do. So if you want to look at a bright side of that, you know, we got to have some hot dogs together. <laughs> That's true. Do you think this is do you think this is uh, some kind of intervention from the publishers where they're like, listen, if we do it this way, these two guys will actually have to see each other in person. So they're actually just they care about our friendship. They do. It's an elaborate plot. You know me, I always think everything's an elaborate plot. So this is an elaborate plot. <laughs> based on all book publishers to do this seriously guys give up give up the the those two figure out a better way but and it's inconsistent because we had a great i i'm gonna say we had a great experience with the little blue kite and mark z danielewski um as far as requesting copies getting copies arranging an interview everything felt like it went very smooth um yeah but we did get to um paper copies i prefer to read in digital so i'm probably the bottleneck in most of this i, I do believe that in a lot of <laughs> cases if we just ask for a second print copy yeah yeah we'll just get a second print copy um i just really prefer from a note-taking standpoint and whatever to do this on my kindle still there's got to be a better way yeah there's got to be a better way anyway um still a great book despite all that stuff at the end there yeah for sure <laughs> Uh, what do we got coming up, man? What's next after this? All right. So, uh, in the, apparently the 2019 tradition, uh, we are going back to an author that we reviewed a few years ago. Um, Fred Venturini's latest book, uh, the escape of light actually came out on my birthday, which was October 8th. 
Um, and because of uh, scheduling with this book, uh, talking to Mark Danielewski and stuff like that, we're hitting it a little bit late. Um, but that's going to be our next book. Very excited to get another thing from him. I, and I keep remembering back to, I'm waiting for, uh, and it'll happen eventually, he told us about a book he was writing that I'm dying to get. This is not that one, but I'm also obviously excited to read this too. Maybe we'll reach out and get an update on that book for you guys um, for the next episode. But that is not this book. As Rob said, The Escape of Light is what we'll be reviewing um, next week. Fred Venturini, by the way, still holds what arguably is the best story in the book anthology. Uh, yeah, and actually I'm holding I, – I, I just I got a little staggered, so I apologize if my response is weird. Holding a copy of The Escape of Light right now, and uh, we're, we're mentioned on the back cover. Did you notice that? Uh, I, uh, I have it in PDF format. His short fiction has been featured in the book anthology, Noir at the Bar 2 and Chuck Palahniuk's Burnt Tongues anthology. Those are good places to be all three of them. That's, uh, that's pretty cool. So, and the neat thing about this book is it's marketed to kind of a younger audience, practically like a young adult type situation. And it's, uh, uh, from what I've read, uh, not of the book, but like about the book, very autobiographical. Um, I, I think I saw, I think I saw online somewhere he was talking, or maybe it was in the acknowledgements at the end. I might've just kind of skimmed that, uh, about how a, a lot of what's in the story is, is digging into his personal experiences of like being a burn victim when he was young and stuff like that. So I did not read any of that stuff, but I, I was just going to tell you, well, it starts off with a kid getting burned. Yeah. If that yeah, helps you out. Any exactly. <laughs> so, yeah. so, um, Yeah. Looking forward to this. He's a he's a good storyteller, and because um, like the heart does not grow back. We really enjoyed mm-hmm. that one. Yep. Um, and yeah, it'll be great. Oh man, I gotta tell you, I feel a, I feel a wheel of meat coming up. I feel like we've read too many good books in a row, <laughs> and I, I I feel like I like you know I know I know Fred's work pretty well, and I get the feeling this is gonna be a good one. Man, we're gonna have to spin that wheel, and just get something right off the New York Times bestseller list and see what happens. I uh yeah. You're especially, by, yeah. Especially since this is not the first episode in the last like few that you've said that on, that's an itch I'm going to have to let you scratch eventually. But um, not before we do our spooktacular. The spooktacular is coming up again. So in the event that you're not a long time listener, several times a year for holiday episodes, we do a video episode on Facebook. It's not your normal episode. We're joined by um, now permanent guest host Misty and Jesse. And essentially, we uh, will talk about, uh, well, this time I know what we're talking about. We're talking about a couple of movies and some Halloween-y kind of stuff. There might be drinking involved, although I do believe it's a weeknight. So <laughs> I know I know at least one of us won't be drinking. That's not me, by the way. I'm a, I took vacation that whole week just for the spooktacular. Wow. Um, and because it's Halloween week. <laughs> um, but uh, those tend to devolve pretty quickly. So if you if you like the goofier stuff on book, you're definitely going to want to check that out. Um, we'll be on Facebook Live on the 28th, which is a Monday night. You'll get to see this pretty mug and Rob and Misty and Jesse. Wow. So put that in your calendars. It is probably, from a hosting perspective, one of my most looked forward to episodes of the year. Because it's just like... Uh, uh, you know, a laid back format. It's like more like hanging out with three friends than it is um, trying to sound semi professional and talk about a book or something like that. So it's fun. We try to make it fun, um, but we try to make it something that's entertaining to listen to as well. So if you're new, if you've just picked up on us recently, um, yeah, sometimes we just kind of cut loose uh, holidays or sometimes we do interlude episodes. Um, and, and this is just a fun, but still kind of topic driven. Uh, discussion it's funny because i describe it almost like you do i say it's like three friends hanging out on a crusty old man's porch wait who's the crusty old man i am because <laughs> constantly good, i'm just good. like shaking my head talking about can we get back on track please <laughs> oh There's... yeah because we'll spend like five minutes talking about like the history of a brand of vodka and livius is just like what the hell yeah. is going on yeah guys <laughs> listen just tune in and see how long it takes them to start talking about the hannibal tv show 
there's there's a privately if you reach out to me i'll share with you there's um um shit what's that called uh like where you uh, put money down on how long it takes to do oh, something like a um they do not, them not a like, lottery but uh, the, yeah um shit what's it called like a pool a pool yeah there's a pool going on how long it'll take him to start talking about Hannibal's. If you message me privately, you can put in your 10 bucks and stand a chance to win 20 because it'll probably just be you versus me. But, All uh, right. Well, here's what I'm going to say, though. Um, and I told Livius this after we got done re- interviewing Mark Danielewski. There was a moment in that interview <laughs> that teed up perfectly for me to mention Hannibal. And <laughs> it was 100% out of out of just love for you, Livia, so that I chose to just bite my tongue and not say anything. Yeah, so I, I know. Um, I, guys, sorry if you were in that pool. I will get you your money back later this week. Nobody <laughs> won the pool for the Daniel Epsky interview. <laughs> Nobody. So I could either roll it over into the Halloween episode, <laughs> or I could just issue you a refund. Yeah. So <laughs> I like Hannibal. What can I say? I don't think I sh- I'm not ashamed of it. We know. We know. So um, thanks for listening. Um, get a copy of John Horner Jacobs' book, A Lush and Seething Hell. You can already get Venturini's book because we're running a little bit behind. So if you want to pick that up and read it before we talk about it next week, also available on Amazon. And uh, that's it for tonight. Yeah, I got nothing else. I'm going to go watch some uh, Hannibal. Of course you are. <laughs> Until next time, I'm Livia Snedden. And I'm Rob Olson. Keep reading. <laughs>